Have you ever heard the saying, everything happens for a reason? Well, I'm sorry to break it to you, but it actually doesn't. Or have you ever said anything like, I knew it all along? Well, again, you probably didn't really. Or I'm sure you heard somebody say, I have a gut feeling that such and such. Yeah, again, I wouldn't go there. I wouldn't trust that. Hi, by the way, I haven't said hi properly. And you might be wondering, what the hell am I talking about? Well, we like to think of ourselves as guided by reason. We identify with our rational self. And in fact, intuition is what gives us most answers instead of reason. Intuition is very useful in many everyday situations. But when we try to make sense of the complex world we live in today, intuition often fails and we get stuck in our skewed and irrational views without realizing and with great overconfidence in our beliefs. As you might know, I am an engineer and I've been a research scientist for many years, which could be considered a character flaw by many, but it kind of makes me a great advocate of reason. So sitting here at my desk, kind of late at night, really, I will talk about how the mind works, how we form opinions, make judgments and predictions. And later on, how a few basic principles of statistics can become the antidote to irrational thinking. I will call this series the power of reason. If this doesn't sound too crazy already, then without further ado, let's get to the thick of it. We all have two ways of thinking, intuitive and rational. Our brain has evolved intuitive thinking to give us quick answers in everyday life. For example, That was supposed to be an angry face. Uh, of course, I smiled after, but if you see this face, you can immediately tell that I'm angry. I mean, of course you saw me smile after, but you can immediately tell that I was smiling or that I was faking my anger. Or if I show you these two objects, a hard drive and a razor, you can immediately tell which one is bigger, or if I put one closer to you, you can immediately tell which one is closer to you. You don't have to solve any equations. If you know how to read English, and I show you a word, like here, the title, the title of this book, hopefully you read mathematical statistics. You can't unread it, right? If I show you the word, you won't be able to just see a set of symbols. Your brain tells you the word immediately. And if I ask you, what is two plus two? Then four comes to mind without having to think. If I say bread and, you thought butter. You can't help but think butter because your intuitive mind gives you an answer whether you want it or not. Some of these abilities are innate and some are acquired with experience, like two plus two. You know it because you've done it a million times as a child. Our rational thinking, on the other hand, is what we engage when we are asked to compute something more difficult, such as 48 times 23. An answer doesn't come intuitively. You need to focus and think about it and do the computation in your mind. We engage our rational thinking when we do our tax returns, when we check the validity of a complex logical argument, or when we try to remember something unusual that doesn't really come to mind immediately. Or also when we focus on anything really, even when we push through a workout and we must stay focused, while of course our intuition is telling us to stop. Rational thinking happens in our frontal cortex and distinguishes us from animals. 
because animals think only intuitively. Rational thinking requires effort, motivation, and it requires more energy consumption in the brain. Notice at this point that being rational is different from being intelligent. Rationality requires engagement. An intelligent person who fails at being engaged fails also at being rational. So rational thinking requires paying attention, which is a limited resource in our brain. This is why we say pay attention. The word pay suggests a limited resource. If I ask you to compute, again, 48 times 23, while you're walking at a fast pace, suppose, you probably have to stop and think, as it is difficult to compute while walking fast. Just how limited our attention is, was demonstrated in a famous experiment, the gorilla experiment. In the experiment, participants were asked to watch a basketball, basketball game. And they were required to keep count of how many times the ball was passed. It's a sure way to ruin a game. But anyway, that was the experiment. While they were busy counting and keeping score, a person in a gorilla costume walked to the middle of the court, stood there, they were beating their chest and whatnot, and then eventually left. At the end of the game, of course, the participants were asked if they had noticed anything unusual. And nobody had seen the gorilla as their attention was focused on following the ball. Attention is a limited resource and magicians exploit this fact in their tricks. They misdirect the attention so you don't see what is really happening in the trick. Precisely because it requires attention and effort, we often fail at engaging our rational thinking. And then our intuitive thinking, which does not require attention, provides us with quick answers in most situations. Our lazy, la rational self then accepts the answers without checking. Let's quickly solve an easy problem. And I want you to think about it. A baseball and a bat together cost $1.10. The bat cost $1 more than the ball. How much is the ball? You thought about it? Okay. So many people, when asked this question, immediately answered 10 cents. The answer comes easily to mind, and so we tend to accept it as valid when it actually would be so quick to check the result by doing well. If the ball is 10 cents, then the bat is $1.10 on its own. Oh, damn, wrong answer, right? Of course, the correct answer is 5 cents. The ball is 5 cents and the bat is $1.05. So together, $1.10. But our rational mind is lazy and accepts the 10 cents answer without even checking. Now, I'm not trying to diminish our intuitive thinking. Our intuitive thinking is extremely useful and it is what gives us common sense and distinguishes us from machines. And in fact, it distinguishes us and all other animals from machines it is still a huge challenge to try and give common sense to artificial intelligence, for example, and we are very far from it. Our intuition gives us answers to complex questions through some simplified subconscious processes called heuristics. Once again, these heuristics are shortcuts our mind uses to give us intuitive answers and judgments without having to engage in the energy consuming rational thinking. However, when we attempt to understand the complex world we live in today, like I said, failing to engage our rationality and relying solely on our intuition, relying on the heuristics, will lead us to making systematic errors in our understanding. 
Systematic errors are known as biases and biases in our thinking are known as cognitive biases. Why am I mentioning all of this? You might ask correctly. Let me just give me one second. Let's say that humanity has accumulated an immense wealth of collective knowledge, which is the case. And in fact, the world is extremely complex in its interactions and operations. So in order to make sense of anything at all, one cannot simply rely on anecdotes or on hearsay or even direct experience. We must be able every day to interpret data, statistics and logical claims of all sorts. Unfortunately, even though our brain can easily think causally or metaphorically, it does not have an intuitive ability for statistical thinking. And this is where the cognitive biases to which we are all subject lead to logical fallacies in our thinking. Understanding these biases is the first step towards a better understanding of the world. As we become more self-critical of our judgments and our opinions. To understand how these biases arise, we must first understand their cause, which is the subconscious mental shortcuts our mind adopts, the heuristics. There are many heuristics with many examples that I'd like to talk about, but I've already been talking a lot today, so we will start with one only, a way in which our intuitive thinking works called thinking by representativeness. Let me begin by saying that our brain likes to make subconscious associations. If I say vomit, you immediately have a reaction, your heart rate, has probably changed and you feel a sense of unease, a mild disgust at the mere word. You can't help picturing it really. You don't have to see or smell vomit, but in your mind, you're getting prepared for the situation, subconsciously. Now, if I say the word wash, and then I ask you, I should have prepared this. Then I ask you to complete this word. Fill in the gap. I hope this is not mirrored. You probably thought soap, right? Now, had I said I'm hungry, and given you the same letters, so S O underscore P, you would have thought soup instead because your mind would have been primed to the idea of food and not to the idea of washing. Our brain likes to create a coherent story and this is why it makes subconscious associations, which are generally very useful and they create context. They guide us in conversation but they can also lead us to contradict logic. Thinking by representativeness is a way of thinking driven by these involuntary associations. We often judge objects and events by how representative they are of a class rather than by how probable they are. If this sounds like jargon, it might be better understood with a classic example from an experiment conducted in the 80s by Daniel Kahneman. I will describe Linda. Linda is a bright woman. She's 30 years old, she's single, and she has a major in philosophy. And as a student, she cared about human rights and social justice. Now, I'll give you two statements about Linda and you have to think about which one of the statements is the most probable one. Number one, 
Linda is a bank teller. Number two, Linda is a bank teller and an outspoken feminist. Most people will judge the second statement as the most probable because it makes for a nice coherent story. Linda does not seem to fit the job of a bank teller based on the description I gave you of her, but adding that she's a feminist seems to be more representative of her character. This is an example of thinking by representativeness. However, this choice contradicts logic. The first statement is the most probable one because the group of feminist bank tellers is wholly contained in the larger group of all the bank tellers. This could also be said in another way. If you bet on the first option, you would win if Linda was a bank teller, either feminist or not. With the second option, you would win only if she was feminist. A more restrictive scenario, hence a less probable one. Bear in mind, this was an experiment from the 80s, so it might seem a bit outdated in the description of its characters. Here, another example. Rafael Nadal, who is obviously a famous tennis champion, is playing a tennis match against a player who is at Wimbledon for the first time. This is completely hypothetical for the exper mental experiment. Which of the following statements is the more probable one? Number one, Nadal will lose the first set. Number two, Nadal will lose the first set, but will win the match. Once again, it is natural to think of the champion winning as more plausible because it's more representative of him. But it is not more probable. If you were to bet on one of the options, with option one, you would win whether Nadal loses or wins the match after losing the first set. And with option two, you would win only if he wins the match after losing the first set, of course. So saying that option two is more probable, therefore contradicts logic. Conjoining two individual in the events reduces the probability. So conjoining lose the first set with win the match reduces the overall probability, independently of the fact that Nadal winning is more representative of the champion. Wrongly thinking that losing the first set and winning the match together is more probable is known as a conjunction fallacy. Okay, I mean, I think it's enough for today. And if you made it this far, well done. And in the next episode, I will show you more ways in which our intuitive mind works with plenty of interesting examples and experiments. The idea here is that Understanding this will help us recognize how we can be biased in our thinking. All right. Thanks a lot. Bye bye.